Hello, good evening. Manu has done his chivalry, so... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, earlier this year, I came out with a book called Mothering a Muslim, which was kindly introduced right now. But post that book, a lot of people came up to me to share their stories of what's happening in the world around them. Um, and one such story was that a very close friend of mine, she mentioned how she has a seven-year-old. And growing up, she never, you know, categorically mentioned to him that you are Muslim or your best friend is Hindu and your teacher is of some religion. She did not kind of put them in these compartments in the child's head. So when the child is seven, this year, they go to watch Padmavat. And Khilji comes on stage. So, and you know how Khilji came, you know, eating raw flesh, murdering people, and dancing that dance. The child turns to his mother and says, Mama, kya ye Muslim hai? Kyunki ye bhot violent lag hai. And the mother was shocked. The mother was shocked because that her own child had internalized a stereotype that, that she had no idea where he had borrowed from. And how do you tell a child that he is what he fears? And how do you gatekeep the larger narrative that is being built around you? Having said that, the narrative will come to the narrative that is being built, uh, that is kind of seeping into all our collective conscience of Muslims being the invaders who were brutal, who were, who were these, the one thing wrong that was done in Indian history. So tell me, Manu, you've written this fantastic book that, was, uh, that I'm finding it very difficult to put down, The Rebel Sultans and you start from Khilji, and you end at Shivaji. So tell me, how political has religion always been in India? Well, the question really is how political has history been in India, because history is increasingly a commodity that is utilized by political parties of all colors and dispensations for their own purposes. So uh, the fact that history is being politicized is not anything that's new. But the nature in which it's being used as an instrument of vengeance against a certain community to sort of paint things in black and white is what uh, we need to sort of guard against. This was kind of done deliberately. Yeah. You know, history is not black and white. <laughs> We're we sort of, yeah, not reinforcing cliches here, but yes. So the idea with the book was very simple. It was to, to show that while religion existed, while bigotry existed, of course it existed, there were bigots across the board. We're talking about times when violence was very much a part of the exercise of power. You could not have power and not be violent. Those were the times we were living in that time. All the same, Indian history is not a clash of religions. It is not a clash of people waking up in the morning saying, I am a Hindu, you're a Muslim, and therefore we can't get along. That's not how it happened. Different kings, different sultanates had their own religious ideologies, their own self-images, which are often rooted in religion. But that did not mean that their actual politics was driven by religion. Then, as today, politics was driven by greed, you know, avarice, desire for money, personal ambition. These were the impulses and motivations that drove people. We often make the mistake of thinking historical figures were somehow different from us. That, you know, when they woke up in the morning, it wasn't like they thought, oh, we're making history today, or oh, we're living in a golden age. They were just leading their lives. It's we who ascribe these values to them. It's we who try and project our anxieties and our uh, insecurities onto the past and try to justify our politics using them as some sort of cannon fodder for this. So that is our flaw, not history's making. So, I mean, the kind of people, you know, one episode that appears towards the end of the book is this 1565 battle where the, the, the Vijayanagar Empire finally collapses. Uh, because the sultans of the northern day can attack it. And this often in textbooks is, pre is presented as this Hindu empire being destroyed by Muslim kings. as a clash of civilizations, a clash of religion, and so on. Yes, Vijayanagar did have a, a self-image which was Sanskritic, which was derived from Hindu notions. And yes, the sultans were obviously Muslim. But was it all that black and white? It wasn't. 
the, the, the king of Vijayanagar at the time, Ramaraya, he began his career working with the Qutub Shah of Golconda, a Muslim sultan. The Qutub Shah who was at that battle spent seven years of his life growing up in Vijayanagar where he was a, a great patron of Telugu poetry. He was a lover of the Mahabharata. His wife was a Telugu woman. He was part of the same battle. The Adil Shah of Bijapur who was also a bat at the same battle, a Muslim, was the adopted son of the emperor of Vijayanagar who he eventually de de defeated. And there's, in fact, there's a, there's a painting where the Qutub Shah is actually pleading for the life of the Vijayanagar emperor before his head is cut off. The, uh, there were 6,000 Marathas at this 1565 battle, but they were fighting for the Sultans. Uh, on the side of the Vijayanagar emperor, there was Ayanul Mul Gilani, a Muslim general of great celebrity, who was fighting for the Hindu king. So was this really a Hindu-Muslim clash? It wasn't. What did people then do? They used religion to justify these core basic political impulses. You take religion because at the end of the day, what you want is money and power and greed and territory, but you can't say that. Then as now politicians knew that you have to give it a gloss or a little varnish that pretends to be superior and something, you know, you derive legitimacy from the skies and from the gods. So for that reason, of course, you justify things in the name of religion. But what you actually do is not necessarily about preserving your faith or protecting the gods. It's very much about much more earthly things. Right, so who is an invader? And you know, why does that term kind of invoke a immediate hatred today? I think invader comes from this insecurity that we cultivated during the colonial era really, which is that you know, we were as, a, as an entire country put down, you know, culturally we were told that we had nothing to contribute and we had to westernize to sort of stand up and so on. But I won't exaggerate that case also. Some of it is, it was sustained well after independence. If we have communal problems that are partly because we ourselves are also uh, to be blamed. But in terms of invader now, you know, this again brings me to the politics of history. If you look at history with the North Indian bias, which is the dominating bias in India, you think, yes, Islam came to India when the swords were raised in the Sindh, you know, the, the Muhammad of Ghori and Ghaznavi and all these people. But, you know, I come from Kerala. The oldest mosque in Kerala was established in the lifetime of the Prophet. And in Kerala, Islam came through peaceful embassies of commerce. The, the building that stands is not that old, so people claim that the mosque is not all that old. But yet, by the 9th century, by the mid-800s, you have Muslims witnessing royal grants. So you have a royal grant by a Hindu king to a Christian, in which the witnesses are Arabs who signed their names in Arabic, which meant by the 9th century, Muslims were already powerful enough to witness royal grants. There is something called the Mapla Ramayana, which is you know, derived from the Hindu Sanskrit Ramayana, where uh, you know, Shurpanaka tries to woo Rama and says, oh, take me for your wife and all of that. And then Rama says, no, no, I'm already married. And she says, no, but in the Sharia, you can take another wife. And then Ramana is presented as a sultan in this. So culture there was much more mixed up. In my own ancestral home in Kerala, like temples across Kerala, when the ghee and the oil came from the market, it, used to, it, it had to wait at the gates till you found a Syrian Christian to come and touch it, to purify it. Because the ghee that went into temples needed to be purified by a Syrian Christian. So what, what you know, sort of black and white boxes are you talking about? All the same, of course, there were bigots, because Afzal Khan, when he goes out to kill Shivaji, you know, he ends up being killed himself. But the point is, he did destroy a lot of shrines on the way without any purpose. The Vijayanagar kings often ended up destroying mosques. But violence, again, was not the monopoly of any one set of rulers or any one religion. So if you say that the sultans were violent because they killed so many people or whatever, you know, Shivaji also, a towering figure in history, but there's this wonderful episode where he conquers a territory called Javli, which is ruled by the uh, a local family of Marathas. He sends a group of diplomats who are actually assassins masquerading as diplomats. And midway in a meeting, they get up, stab the ruler of Javli, and that's how Javli was conquered. So was violence, you know, why don't we talk about that violence? In Vijayanagar, you, you say that the Mughals were, you know, they killed their fathers and brothers to come to power. That happened in Vijayanagar. A Vijayanagar emperor came to power by killing his brother. That guy killed his father. You know, so these things were happening all the time. Devaraya II, who is a celebrated ruler of Vijayanagar, he, uh, a cousin or a nephew, the relationship isn't clear, he tried to orchestrate a coup. Devaraya survived, but what he did was to cut his head off, held, hold that in his hand, get on a horse and ride up and down the main street of Hampi, Vijayanagar, because he wanted to show people that he was still alive. When you were in power in the late medieval or early modern era, before democracy and institutions came about, power and violence went hand in hand. It had nothing to do with religion, even if that generation as well, they justified it in the name of religion. As a historian, you're meant to look at these things critically, not take things at face value. You mentioned just now, well, that 
the North has always kind of overshadowed the history of the South, the Deccan. Why is that? Why haven't we grown up hearing these stories? I think one of the reasons is that, um, you know, Indian history is also dominated very much by the freedom struggle. And much of the drama of the freedom struggle happens in the North. If you look at the South, even in the colonial period, even the freedom struggle, most of the, the politics was about caste reform, social reform. See, Gandhiji had a massive appeal across the board, but you know, his activity was often largely in the North, except for a few instances like the Vaikam Satyagraha or whatever. But look at Periyar, you know, a man who began every meeting saying, God, he who invented God is a scoundrel, he who invented God is a barbarian. I mean, you, you, know, you don't want your textbooks and your school children listening to that, because after we became independent, that wasn't entirely convenient. So Periyar is sort of played down, and you know, wonderful things about religion and people who are much more acceptable came in. The other thing is, even today, power resides in the north. So when power is in the north, when Delhi is the capital, what gets written in Delhi ends up tilting the narrative towards Delhi. The other thing is our national narrative also. I mentioned the whole idea of Islam, uh, you know, coming in very differently into South India. But our national narrative being north-focused, it gets complicated if you introduce the south too much. So we, we like to believe that Ahimsa was a wonderful philosophy which we've always had. You should read Upinder Singh's book, Political Violence in India, which talks about how violence was all over the place. From the Rig Veda down to your Manusmriti to everything, violence was part of everyday life here. But what is interesting also is that um, Outsider, insider. Now, you'd say that Ahimsa was part of us. We never conquered any other country. But hey, you're forgetting the Cholas. How did, you know, Hindu culture or Hindu civilizational values and all of that get exported to Southeast Asia? It was on navies. It was on ships. It was traders also. But there were military interactions that took place. So we did also try and conquer other countries. It wasn't like the South was innocent of that. But it screws up our national narrative. The other thing is insider, outsider, right? So the Mughals are outsiders because they came from somewhere else. That's interesting because then Nandi Varman II, the Pallava emperor in the uh, 8th century, I think, the Pallava royal family one fine morning woke up, the emperor was dead, and they thought, hold on, we don't have heirs. Then they go into the family tree and the Brahmins are like, hold on, three generations before, a Pallava prince had got on a ship and gone to Cambodia or Vietnam and married a local woman there. So the Brahmins then get on a ship, go there, discover a 12-year-old boy with his Southeast Asian features and all of that. They import him into Kanchivuram and install him as Nandi Varman, the Kanchivuram Pallava emperor. So does that mean all the Pallava emperors afterwards were not Indian because their ancestor was born in Southeast Asia? So, you know, the, the politics of writing history also comes into this, the politics of producing textbooks where you take a country of such startling diversity and try to cram everything into 50 pages, you end up picking and choosing. And the picking and choosing is always done by politicians, which is why every new government wants to rewrite the textbooks. Or even the, um, even so all the Muslim kings have been called outsiders, while many, most of them, and according to your book, many of them, have uh, had mothers who were Hindus. I mean, that, that's a funny thing, you know, the Adil Shah, so on the cover of the book, the ro reason we chose this particular painting is because you have this elephant, which, you know, elephant is, the elephant is associated with India. The man riding it up front is the Adil Shah of Bijapur, and at the back with him is an attendant, a noble of his called Iklas Khan. And the Adil Shah is an interesting dynasty, because if you look at their name and, you know, use your textbook definitions of these kings, Adil Shah equal to Muslim, you know, as clear as that. But the first Adil Shah, Yusuf, some say he was Georgian, but broadly he's considered Persian. He came as a mercenary to India, got on a ship, was on the way here. Somewhere on the way, like our so-called ship Brahmins, you know, when indentured labor, laborers went out, on the ship they often upgraded their caste, because then when they landed in their new island territories in Trinidad or wherever, nobody knew where they were coming from, so they could claim to be higher caste. So similarly, on the way here, Yusuf decided, I'm going to pretend I'm a long-lost son of the Ottoman Sultan. So he came in, he said, oh yes, I'm, you know, my life was in danger from my brother, so my mother sort of secreted me out and I survived and here I am in the Deccan. He marries a Maratha woman. So from the very start, the Adil Shahis are a mix of this Persian man and a Maratha lady. And the Maratha lady is not a docile, passive figure in history because two generations later, when a grandson comes to power and he's not quite up to the mark, she has no qualms blinding him, putting him to the side and choosing an illegitimate grandson. So she was a political actor. She was a woman with a say in, in matters of politics and state. So it was this Maratha woman and this Persian man who created the Adil Shahi dynasty. And for the, the nearly 200 years they ruled, rulers kept switching between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Rulers kept switching between the Persian side of their heritage and the Maharashtrian side of their heritage. So Ibrahim Adil Shah II, who is one of the stars of the book, you know, this was a man who was officially a Sunni Muslim, 
but he also wore the Rudrakshmala, painted his nails red, and called himself son of Guru Ganapati and Saraswati. He was so besotted with Saraswati, he wanted to rename Bijapur Vidyapur. He commissioned art in which Saraswati appears like an Islamic princess. In her costume, she looks like she's wearing Persian clothes. But if you look closely, she's got the veena, the conch, the lotus, the symbols that are associated with Saraswati, because his Saraswati was an Islamic Saraswati. That's how he, you know, saw her. That was his vision it of Saraswati. It was a beautiful marriage. It was. And this wasn't merely the Muslim sultans, the Vijayanagar kings as well. From 1352, which is fairly early, from the time of the founding of the empire itself, one of the titles they used was Hindu Raya Suratrana, which is fascinating because on the one hand, they, these are the first rulers to use the word Hindu consciously to define themselves, Hindu Raya. And, but Suratrana is a Sanskritization of the word Sultan. So the Vijayanagar kings are saying the northern Deccan is ruled by Muslim sultans, we are Hindu sultans. There is this beautiful bronze in the Tirupati temple of Krishna Devaraya and his wives. Look closely. Now, of course, they've draped the women in saris because topless women are, even if it's bronzes, you're not allowed to be topless anymore, so saris are there. But look, they haven't managed to cover up Krishna Devaraya's head. He's wearing a Turkish hat because Persianized Islamic culture, it was soft power as American culture is it today. It was just cool. It was the it fat. It was cool, yeah. So in Vijayanagar, you go to the, the, the ruins in Hampi, the uh, oldest sculptures, the oldest ruins you find there, the people look like your average South Indian. They're wearing the munda or the lungi or whatever, and the, the torso is left bare. As times pass and as the Persian influence increases, these tunics start appearing, the Persian hat starts appearing. Persian ambassadors start coming in and they would welcome. You see Arabs uh, perpetually so, sort of enshrined in the stone in, Vijay, in, in stone in Vijayanagar where they're dancing and entertaining the Vijayanagar emperor. In the famous Vithala temple, which is you know, integral to Vijayanagar and its identity, there's a pillar which shows an Arab warrior on a horse. So Arabs exist even in one of the most sacred shrines in Vijayanagar. Of course, they saw themselves consciously as Hindus, but they were not about absorbing influences that came from around the world. Persian, as late as the 1810s, was used as language of diplomacy. It was only in the 1830s that the British stopped using it. I was stunned when I was doing my first book to discover letters written by the Malayali Maharani of Travancore to the English governor of Madras in Persian, because that's how they did it. So Persian culture was a soft power asset, which everybody used, and it wasn't limited in terms of religion. So again, very mixed up and very complicated and layered as opposed to the, the textbook narratives that we get. So you mentioned the first king who used Hindu, who identified himself as Hindu. Where did this us versus them narrative start from? And where do you first find uh, cow killers being used for Muslims? I think the us versus them at some level, in, in the corridors of power, there was some concept of us versus them. For example, Hindu kings, their power was often attached to a temple. Which is why, as late, like Tipu Sultan, when he went to war against the Maharaja of Travancore, he said, I shall tie my horse on the flagstaff of your temple in Trivandrum. He never made it as far as Trivandrum. He wasn't interested in destroying all the temples in the way. He was interested in the temple that legitimized the Maharaja of Travancore. Just as the Vijayanagar emperors, when they went to war against the sultans in the northern Deccan, they destroyed mosques that were integral to the sultans and their personal identity. So at elite levels, because a lot of your court culture, a lot of your personal identity was closely linked to the gods you claim to protect or the legitimacy you derive from various gods, attacking those gods was there. Which is why texts as early as the, the 1300s, the Madura Vijayam, the Sanskrit poem that exists when Vijayanagar expels the Muslims from Madurai and takes over Tamil territories, it says, yes, Brahmins were killed and cows were being slaughtered in the streets and blood was flowing red in the rivers and things like that. Now, the Twitter school of history or the WhatsApp school of history will take these things at face value. A historian will interrogate the text. What language is the text written in? Sanskrit. Which means who's the target audience? Not the lay Tamil person. It's the Tamil elite. You're trying to speak to the priests of the temple. You're trying to speak to the aristocracy. People who exist at the highest levels of society. And what is the text trying to achieve? Vijayana, now Tamil Nadu has had its Pandyas, its Cholas, you know, its own proud dynasties that occupy its space in public imagination there. So when Vijayanagar comes out, a Telugu Kannada enterprise from another faraway capital, they're also foreigners. So to make themselves look less foreign, they will make A, the Muslims look more foreign and try and convey that they are somehow defenders of some sort of dharmic cause. But at the end of the day, it was territorial annexation. Vijayanagar faced rebellions there and eventually they had to concede a lot of autonomy to them. So, you know, so that's why you see beginnings of this us versus them. The most striking sentence I found when I was doing my research was in the, in the late 17th century, 1683, where one of the Brahmin ministers of the Kutub Shah of Golconda, and as I said, Kutub Shahs are great patrons of the Mahabharata, of the Telugu language. Ashetraya not only found 
patronage for his bhakti poetry in Madurai and Tanjore, but also in the court of the Qutub Shah, where he composed 1,500 padams. So the Qutub Shahs uh, had a minister called Maddana, who had a brother, Akana. And Akana is talking to a Dutch merchant where he says, oh, these Persians come here, they make their money and they take it back to their homelands and their holy lands. We only have this one country, so we are better in terms of ruling. That's very interesting because it's almost like a 17th century Savarkar, holy land, fatherland. These are words that Savarkar introduced eventually. But it does hint at the germination of an idea among the elites, among people right on top, that their power interests were not always aligned. There was some sort of competition. So Brahmins will work happily in the court of the Sultans, just as they'll work in the court of the, of, of the Vijayanagar emperor. But the Sultans, their, their, their statecraft, their ideology is always expressed in Islamic terms. So they may marry local women, they'll patronize poetry, they may be Sanskrit scholars themselves, but when it comes to justifying their power, they will do it in Islamic terms. Hindus will do it in Sanskritic terms, even when they're allowing their Muslims to eat beef, even when they have a Quran kept next to the throne. Because reality is not always what court propaganda is. It's a little bit like the BJP today, where officially you're not supposed to eat beef, but you can go to Mizoram and say, of course, eat all the beef you want. You can come to Kerala and say, eat all the beef you want, because what you say is not necessarily always how you negotiate things on the ground. So even when we're looking at texts, we should learn to look at them in their context and understand the politics that existed around texts, rather than reading texts at face value and confirming our own existing preconceptions. That brings me to the question that preconceptions kind of also start, the not as the trend is, that you need to stand up and answer. As a Muslim, I need to stand up and answer for Aurangzeb, I need to stand up and answer for Tipu. So, so tell me, within this temple demolisher to the temple protector narrative, where, what is the real uh, picture that people need to understand? As I said, this is plain politics. This is nothing else but people who are, who are jobless, literally. It is jobless growth that allows this sort of thing to thrive. And, you know, this is standard textbook nonsense to divide people. And the fact, I mean, my only concern is the way history is perverted to justify this. Because history is what apparently lends a foundation to this sort of nonsense that's happening. But in reality, history does, it, it's much more complicated than that, as we've been discussing. So it's demolisher or protector? It doesn't have to be either. I mean, people, the people in the past exist in their own universe. We cannot apply our standards to them and seek answers in our time from them. At their time, politics was conducted a certain way, religion was conducted a certain way. That happened then. The mark of an insecure society is when we keep trying to find vengeance and uh, anxious sort of uh, details from the past because we have nothing better to do now. Or it is to distract people from what is happening now. So it is, all of this is merely a distracting mechanism. I don't think what matters now is whether you're protecting a temple or demolishing a temple. There are far graver concerns that exist. Of course, culture matters. Why is it that they want to construct this particular temple in this particular place because of various reasons? And yet, they have no issues where there are thousands of temples that are falling to pieces, thousands of temples that are not being protected, thousands of temples where, uh, go to a temple as, as big as the Madurai Meenakshi temple, the wiring, the tube lights, it's atrocious. There, there are places where the woodwork is exquisite and you see these loose wires hanging there. And you're like, this you don't care about, this you don't want to repair, you don't want to sustain what you have, but you want to pick a quarrel about something that happened in the 17th century. That talks about your insecurity and your problems now rather than about some grave mm. issue we must confront, confront as a society. So was it Shivaji versus, was it the Shivaji versus Aurangzeb feud that actually, you know, finally brought down that syncretic culture of India. Was I don't it think it brought the, down anything because even Shivaji. The, no, the founding stones were laid. The thing is, even, that's our interpretation of Shivaji versus Aurangzeb. Now look, when Aurangzeb clashed against Shivaji, Muslim hating a Hindu, but look at who Aurangzeb sent to deal with Shivaji, a Rajput general. So at the end of the day, the same Aurangzeb who was calling Shivaji an infidel dispatched an infidel general to go and fight Shivaji and win his victories for him. So again, we have to be circumspect when we approach this. But all the same, Shivaji himself. He, in the 1670s, there was this court poem he commissioned called the Shiva Bharata, it's Sanskrit, and it was commissioned by his own court poet. And this poem tells you a lot about Shivaji, what he, how he saw himself. So in one part of the poem, he will say that he is a Vishnu incarnate to rid the world of the, world of the Mlechas, Mlechas being the Muslims. This is a Hindu king saying, I will now, you know, stand up for Hindu might or whatever. He said, I'm going to deny Persian words. I'm going to get rid of this Yavana foreign speech. And I'm going to start using Sanskrit. So by the end of his reign, he was consciously writing letters, not in Persian, but in Sanskrit through Rajput leaders. That was Shivaji at the time. 
But the same poem also refers to the Nizam Shah of Ahmed Nagar as a Dharmatma. It refers when his father goes off and joins the service of the Adil Shah of Bijapur, it compares that kingdom to Ram Rajya. Uh, the same Shiva Bharata elsewhere refers to Malik Ambar, the Muslim African general, as as brave as the sun. It compares him to the god Kartikeya and says as Kartikeya was protected by the gods, Shivaji's father and grandfather protected Malik Ambar. So Shivaji was also aware that he lived in a time when there's far more of a mix-up. Afzal Khan comes to, to fight Shivaji. Look at the people who came with Afzal Khan. They're Marathas, Gorpade, Pingle, these are the names that came with him. Shivaji's side, you have Siddhi Ibrahim. So things get complicated once you start looking at the detail of this matter. Does that mean religion did not play a role? No, it did. Does that mean bigots did not exist? Of course they did, because for every syncretic, wonderful person you can find, or every five of them, you'll find at least two who were possibly bigots or who used religion to their, uh, for their various political purposes. But as I said, history is not an instrument of vengeance. History is, we can choose whether it should be an instrument of vengeance or a mosaic of wisdom from which we should draw and from which we should learn and craft for ourselves a more confident future. Our ancestors were not people who wallowed in self-pity and some sense of insecurity. Look at the art we created. Look at the, look at the kind of poetry we created. Some of the stuff I found is stunning. You know, there's this, uh, there are two examples I'll give. One is the Srirangam Temple. The Srirangam Temple was sacked by the first invaders who came from Delhi. But, you know, Brahmins in India had a very wonderful way of managing to get over awkward corners in history and move on, which was by inventing legend, inventing stories. So in Sri Rangam, they created a story after the Muslims sacked the temple and the processional idol was taken away. A story was created that the, a lady followed the Muslim army all the way to Delhi, to the Tughlaq Emperor's court, and she saw where the idol was kept. Then she came all the way back to Sri Rangam, and in Sri Rangam, she went and told the priest, I know where your idol is, you better go and fetch it from there. So the priests go all the way to Delhi, where they dance for the Tughlaq Emperor and they sort of entertain him or whatever. And the Tughlaq Emperor says, I'm very pleased with you. Ask me what you want, I will give you a, I'll grant your wish. And they say, we want our idol back. So he says, sure, go to the storeroom and fetch my idol, as if idols are sitting in storerooms in a palace. So then he, the staff goes to the storeroom and they discover, hold on, the Tughlaq princess, the Sultan's daughter, is playing with the, the idol as a doll. Now the playing is very important because in bhakti culture, when you worship a deity, you feed the deity, you dress the deity, you take him out for walks and baths and processions. And she was treating the idol like a doll, like her friend, and she was doing the same thing. So in a way, the princess was venerating the, the idol, the, the, the image. So when she's asleep, the idol is taken from her, and she wakes up and she's completely scandalized that her beloved friend is gone. So she then comes all the way to Sri Rangam, where today she's enshrined in the wall of that temple as Tuluka Nachiar, Tughlaq Princess. That's what it means, Tuluka. And when the deity comes on his processional evening round of the temple to that particular part, he's dressed in a certain, uh, in, in, in a colorful lungi, which is supposed to be the mark of the South Indian Muslim, the mapala and so on. And he's fed chapatis as, as prasad, which is a North Indian food in the South Indian temple. Because they are trying to situate in their own legends a Muslim and trying to come to terms in a way with the, the, the coming of the Muslims. The other thing in terms of confidence of our ancestors, you know, the, uh, the Maratha rule of Tanjaur, who's a, a nephew of Shivaji's, because a branch of the family went off to the south, they ruled Tanjaur in the, so in the early 18th century, early 1700s, Shahu the first, I think, he was ruling there. Maratha king in Tamil territory with Rajput and Afghan generals and whose court language is Telugu. He composes a poem called Satidana Suramu, which is in Telugu, where this Brahmin called Moro Batlu, the pious, comes for a temple uh, festival there. And on the way, he sees an utterly stunning, beautiful woman. So he stops his disciples and says, ah, beautiful woman, I must woo her. It so happens the woman is an untouchable. She's a Dalit. And the irony is the Brahmin with his Shastras and Dharma, he goes there saying, your, you know, your, your figure is this, your, this is that, you must spend a night with me and all of that. And the untouchable woman turns around saying Shastra, Dharma, Karma and all of that. So in the early 18th century, the Maratha king of Tanjaur had no issue writing a satire where he completely topples the caste system and gives the Dalit woman all sorts of common sense and the Brahmin who's completely sort of befuddled with her beauty and can't see anything beyond it. And you know, it comes to, uh, anyway, I mean, it's a fascinating story. So the idea is even the art we created, even the literature we created, there's so much confidence, there's so much richness in it. And here we are sitting and trying to figure out, is the cow sacred? Is it not sacred? Who must venerate the cow? Who must eat the cow? It is genuinely, genuinely tragic that we try and, try and reduce what is a magnificent heritage where so many influences have come in over so many centuries into these core hooligans games, that is the tragedy of Indian history. I agree. So tell me, what can the North learn from the South?
begin with, it can learn to treat women better. <laughs> I, my first book was about the Travancore royal family, which was a matrilineal royal family. So, you know, when the, when the queen came to power, she did not come because her father was a king, it was because she inherited it through her mother. She was not called, in, colloquially she was called the Maharani, but her official title was always Maharaja, because no matter who ruled, you were a Maharaja. That was the title. There was no gender dis distinction there. Her husband was only called the consort. He was not even called the husband because he was not her equal. He was inferior. He was not a highness. The Maharani was her highness with a string of 15 titles. Her husband was Mr. So-and-so. When uh, there were feasts in the palace, the Maharani's husband was served two desserts, whereas she got four desserts. He could not sit in the presence of his wife. He had to remain standing till he was asked to sit down. And uh, he had to refer to his wife as his, her highness. He could never call her by name. He couldn't in the old days stay in the main palace where she resided. He had to stay in an outhouse, only visiting the royal bedchamber when he was invited. And the queen was allowed to have more than one husband, which greatly confused the English when they came there in the late 17th century and discovered that the queen of Traven, the king of Koilon was actually a queen and that she had a harem of men. And uh, uh, also when the, when the Maharani's husband dies, he's not even allowed to die in the palace. He's lifted with a scot and taken to a faraway building because he's not a member of the royal family, so he can't die in the palace. And his wife and children don't even attend the funeral. Even though they may come from him, his wife and children are higher in status from him. Of course, the Maharaja's wife is also equally uh, considered a commoner. She has no status either. But Kerala was a place where, till the coming, till the, till the Victorians came and essentially introduced a sense of modernity mixed with patriarchy. So Kerala, for all its wonderful human development, all its wonderful employed women, its high divorce rate because women don't take shit, Despite all of that, modern education in Kerala was also a patriarchal education. Because what it did, it was the earliest text, uh, magazines you find in Kerala. They talk about how we will not talk about politics and economics. These are women's magazines. We will talk only about things that energize the moral conscience. What is this that they're trying to convey? Put an end to the matrilineal system. Stay in the kitchen. Take care of your kids and husband. Let your husband man manage money, matters of money and land. Um, you know, only have one husband. It's not good to have more than one husband. Start wearing a blouse because till the 1940s, people walked about topless in Kerala. And not merely the lower caste. The first Brahmin woman to wear a blouse in the 1920s was excommunicated. Just as Brahmin men were excommunicated for wearing shirts because these were seen as Western, you know, evil influences of the West, wearing a blouse. Now you go back to... Uh, the, the ultra right wing people who want to bring back tradition in Kerala and suggest that their women start uh, stop wearing blouses, I don't think they're going to respond very well to this tradition. But they want the other tradition, you know, where uh, things are introduced in a certain way and things are interpreted in ways that are convenient for them. So what the South can teach in general, not only from its current trends, but also its, its general history is as a peninsula, as a trading society, Excluding yourselves or trying to avoid modern ideas or new ideas or new insights that are not necessarily born in your land and your country, it's perfectly natural. The South has always been a trading culture. It's always imbibed influences from various places. You know, the Mapla community in Kerala, as I mentioned, they've got Arab blood. Uh, the oldest founding legend in Kerala, Chairman Perumal, a Hindu king, he claims in his legends, the, the claim is he saw the prophet splitting the moon. So the oldest legend of Kerala's Hindu king, and from which all the other dynasties draw their legitimacy, already involves Islamic influences. We now have this one shape of our country, and we like to believe that the country was always in this particular shape and size and with one compact culture. It wasn't. Delhi had more in common with Kabul than it had with South India. Kerala had more in common with Arabia. And why look into history even now? Where do all the Malayalis go to Gulf? Because they have a, a long-standing historical relationship with the Gulf. You know, the, the Coromandel Coast had relationships that stretched into Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, in that direction. So the South can tell you that look at history from a completely different perspective. History is not a game of us and them. It's not a game of if you win, then I lose. It's not, an, uh, you know, a black and white uh, tradition. History is much more mixed up, it's much more complex, and it's much richer for that reason. Why have our textbooks not, not helped us understand history the way you do it? Because this book, ladies and gentlemen, is, is, it just goes as a story. You don't feel like putting it down. It's, uh, uh, why, why weren't we taught history like this? I think, you know, one of the reasons, as I mentioned, uh, the country is so complex, the country is so layered and so rich with all these stories, how is a school teacher going to teach a textbook that's 50 pages that's supposed to somehow encapsulate all this? So I would say in higher education, as kids get older is when they need, need to be introduced to these ideas in a more sustained fashion. And the other thing is also that this division we have where all the engineers study only engineering and have no connection to the humanities, and all the humanities kids are completely cut off from the, you know, the sciences, 
that is a very risky thing because you don't end up having well-formed minds. You end up having people who are experts in very small areas, but they also think that they're well-educated, so they know everything about everything. So, you know, that creates a lopsided way of looking at the world, and that is why our, our textbooks continue to be written in this bad way. What you need is, A, to forget about textbooks, and A, encourage people to read in general. One of the reasons nobody likes textbooks is because they're written so badly. You know, why would you? I didn't study history formally because I did it in my first year in college, and I was appalled by the kind of material and text we had to study. So I said, okay, let me just get on with my major in economics and do history on the side because it was killing any passion you might have in the subject. So I think... All the same, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic about it for the simple reason that when my first book came out, it was a 700-pager about an obscure lost queen of Travancore, of a place called Travancore that nobody knew anything about. And it was 700 whole pages by a complete non-entity, me. The very fact that the book sold was proof that people are willing to give interesting stories a chance. It was proof that people are willing to be to buy books that tell history in an engaging, interesting fashion. One of the other tragedies is also that good history, well-researched, interesting history often languishes in the academic circuit. It languishes in the seminar circuit, and therefore, most of the people don't end up getting access to that. And this, the, 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 the side effect of that has been that the right has, and some in the extreme left also, they've managed to pervert history precisely because of this, because it's open territory. Nobody's made the effort to bridge academic rigor with mass engagement with the subject, with the result that it's very easy to read something wrong and sell it to the masses saying, look at this, you must seek revenge from that 17th century, Babar ki aulad or whatever. And you know, uh, for people who hate Babar, I like reminding them of this place called Shabrimala recently in the news. But before you go up to Shabrimala, you have to pay, your, uh, you have to pay homage to a Muslim deity called Vavar, which sounds painfully to some like Babar. But yeah, that's why the Ayyappans first go, the people who worship Shabrimala Ayyappan first go to a local Babar, Worship there and then go up the hill to meet the, meet the main deity. I think uh, this has been very interesting, Manu. And I think you have kind of equipped us, well equipped us to handle all kinds of uh, rhetorics that are thrown at us in the media and narratives that are forming around us. And I think we're also well equipped to challenge them now. I think I'll open this for a question and answer and let's see what you know, something new that comes up. I see so many hands. Can we have a mic for the audience, please? Or you can just take my mic. Is there a mic for the audience? Is there a mic for the audience? I don't see anyone. Yeah. Can you please give a mic to the audience? <coughs> yes, yes, behind you, behind you, sir. There's a mic behind you. Uh, a, a, a very naive question, uh, Manu. Why did you call them rebel sultans apart from Shivaji? And should that description also continue to Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan a century later? Yeah, I mean, I used the word rebel sultans because the first of the sultans, the Bahmani sultans, they were essentially breaking away from the Delhi sultans in rebellion when they created the Bahmani Sultanate in the Deccan. So they were the first rebel sultans. And the subsequent ones, the Adil Shahs, Qutub Shahs, and the Nizam Shahs in Ahmednagar, Golconda, and Bijapur, uh, they, in, they in turn were in rebellion against the Bahmani Sultan when they founded off their successor states. So, and these states were not modern states as they came to be in the 18th century. Tipu, for example, was trying to create a modern state. He was trying to imitate a lot of Western ideas of how armies should be and how power should be centralized and so on. Whereas these sultans, they were presiding over military states where boundaries weren't clear, power balances were already, always shifting. Your noblemen had tremendous power. So Shivaji's father, for example, in one season could work with the Nizam Shah, the next season with the Adil Shah, and the final season with the Mughals. Before the Mughals finally, he went back to somebody else, the Mughals defeated him, and then they sort of banished him to the south. So any nobleman could easily move around a great deal. There was great elite mobility where it came to generals and armies and so on. So these states were not settled states. It depended at any given time on how much power and how many, how many nobles uh, a sultan could sort of claim as his, as his allies. Otherwise, it was constantly shifting. So it was partly rebel sultans because they were always in rebellion and they were always trying to hold the balance over this very unsteady edifice of power that eventually folded when the, when the Mughal emperors came. And I didn't go all the way to Tipu and Hyder Ali because I wanted to end it with Shivaji because the reason it begins with Khilji is that Khilji inaugurates in the Deccan something new, which is that before him you have the old Hindu dynasties, the Kakatiyas, the Hoysalas, the Yadavas, they fold and then you have Khilji inaugurating the Islamic age. And then Shivaji comes up and he inaugurates a completely new Sanskritically, Sanskrit inspired Hindu age. So I thought these centuries in the middle made for a good, neat sort of uh, chapter in history, which is why I, I stopped there. 
female voices for equal balance. Okay, there's a line of thinking that a lot of history has been distorted by the British. So the history that we see, uh, maybe not today, you know, you know, in the last couple of years, a lot of people have written about uh, Indian history, you included. But there has also been a lot of distortion by the British. They have given an Abrahamic flavor to history. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's true, but I wouldn't only blame the British for the simple reason that what are our politicians doing now? They're also distorting history. Simply because they came from another country, it's very convenient to make them sort of very clear villains of the peace. But we are the ones who also lapped it up. And we've had enough time to move on from it, and we're the ones failing to do that. So if they did something to justify their power at the time, that's what people in power do all the time, across the board. We are still happily lapping up that history, but the point is that when you're in power, you're going to be tempted to play with history. So the British, to justify their rule, would play up certain things, play up conflict as opposed to the syncretic tradition. Similarly, the way they uh, envisioned Hinduism, for example, this is one of the most fascinating things in the 19th century. They essentially said Hinduism equal to Hinduism of the Brahmins. That's very interesting because it's a very complicated faith. Different castes had different versions of Hinduism. A lot of castes, now you, you say that, uh, you know, your texts are important. Now why is it that texts are only, they only exist among the upper castes? What about this huge majority that's at the bottom? They had no texts, they had no literacy, they were singing songs, it was folklore. None of that got codified. So even what we think of as Hinduism was what the British ended up codifying because they came from an enlightenment uh, perspective where texts were important. But it's again our failing that even today we seem to think that the Shastras are all there is to Hinduism when in reality there's much, much more. So, while they did influence Indian history, while they, they did rewrite Indian history, what they did was not unusual. All people in positions of power tried to twist it to their advantage to make themselves look like the saviors of the day, which is what our politicians are doing then, and then the British were ruling us, they did that as well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in, as, as, in black and white terms. Again, I would say that there are many complexities to it. And I'm not entirely on board to even saying that the British were all equally villains. My favorite example is Arthur Cotton in, in the Godavari Belt, where he irrigated that entire region. And there are thousands of statues, an estimated 3,000 statues of Arthur Cotton there, where every year on his birthday, people go and garland the statues and do an arti around him, because it was because of his canals that the farmers are able to reap their harvest. So again, much more complicated than we like to believe. And as I said, it's always easier to fa blame the outsider. We, we, we have this appetite for the other. Someone we can look at and say, that's who we're going to define ourselves against. That again is a mark of insecurity. But I suppose human beings have done it throughout history and we'll keep doing it. Yeah, so uh, I had a question, yeah. Uh, so very little is known about the uh, uh, dynasties in southern India. So like, uh, the crown is made in you know, Britain to talk about the British monarchy in detail, Victoria and the crown. Do you think such a TV series or TV show would uh, you know, educate the public? Because as you, as you mentioned, a history book is the minimum 50 pages you can't explain. But there's so many dynasties which are lost and you know, probably to revive it and to reach the masses. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great way to make history engaging. And the, the advantage with a lot of these Western productions is that they stay as close as possible to the established record, even though you do end up taking some creative leaps. So there is this one line in The Crown, for example, where Princess Margaret says something along the lines of, oh, my sister is the good princess, and I can only be the bad princess. It's funny. She didn't say the dialogue when she was a young woman. She wrote this in a letter many, many, many years later, but they used that same dialogue, which actually did come out of her pen, and used it in a different context. So they've taken a creative leap there, but it is on the record. It is something she actually did say. There is plenty of scope for, for you know, history to be brought alive on screen in India. In fact, my first book was sitting and hammering out a contract with the, pro with the production house, and my second uh, book was also under negotiations, but then that's uh, sort of suspended for the time being. I think there is an appetite. I think that it will grow increasingly because we are interested in looking at our past. And young people especially are very, very interested in figuring out what our past was all about. And I'm actually quite optimistic because the kind of, you know, besides your usual trolling which says that, oh, you're anti-Hindu, you're part of some conspiracy to destroy India and all of that, there are enough people who are genuinely trying to engage, which means when there is a market, people will respond. So booksellers will respond, filmmakers will respond, and there will be more and more of this happening. Uh, in which scripture or uh, era uh, the word Hindu is uh, used for the first time? I think it's as, 
I mean, as I said, the Hinduraya Surathrana, that's on an inscription that the Vijayanagar emperors uh, had made in 1352. So that's one of the earliest places where Hindu is used by Indians for themselves. But the earlier use of it, Hindu is usually in Arabic texts, it's by Arab traders, it's by foreign writers, where they refer to everybody of the subcontinent as Hindus. And that included people, even you know, the sons of Muslims or Arabs who'd come here and married local women, even they were all classed as Hindus. But in India, it's this Vijayanagar inscription from 1352 that for the first time has Indians referring to themselves as uh, Hindus. I imagine they, I mean, as time passes, we'll probably come up with other things here and there as well. And not necessarily always in India. I think the oldest uh, um, uh, version or the oldest written down version of the Ramayana is in Nepal. It's not in modern day India. And the oldest inscriptional evidence that, that sort of talks about the Ramayana is in Cambodia somewhere, not even in India. So we may actually end up finding these words elsewhere rather than here. That side maybe because they're not getting a chance. Um, hello, sir. Um, I, I, as you said, we should not make a parallel between what is ha what has happened in 17th century. So we should get rid of history, just read it and don't make a parallel. But recently, after the Oxford speech, uh, it uh, the reparations that British showed to India, so it elicited a feeling of nationality to many people who forgot what happened. So, uh, do you think that we should, and in a debate with many Brits and Indians in BBC, they were saying that it happened, their ancestors did it, so we should forget it and move on, and that Britain don't owe any reparation. Maybe we can acknowledge like Canada did in the Komakadamaru incident. So, do you think uh, our government, rather than being cowage land, uh, use these things to in elicit a feeling of nationality rather than in theatres? Or should we just get rid of it and move on, like the others said, like the 17th century, without being tagged as an anti-national? My own personal feeling would be to move on for the simple reason that we are what we are in the 21st century. If you start seeking revenge from history, there's going to be no end to it. Societies will be ripped apart across the board because if you're simply trying to set the balance straight and set scores right, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very foolish game. The world is what it is. Why aren't we, as I said, why aren't we creating monuments? Why are we constructing Antilla, not something we can be proud of? Even when you have a Sardar Patil statue, why must it be so ugly? Why can't it be creative? Why can't it be done in a way that five centuries from now, people won't look and say, Acha, statue, they'll say, wow, what was this? You know, we cannot keep blaming what happened in the past. Why aren't we trying to do better? Why aren't we trying to improve ourselves? Why aren't we trying to beat the record of our great ancestors? We like trying to say, that, we like saying that, you know, our ancestors were glorious. Why aren't we setting new standards in, in glory and great? No, because that's difficult. That takes time. That takes a degree of vision and commitment. We don't want to do that. Instead, we want stuff from the British Museum to be transported back and kept here. I mean, great if they do. To me, even if they don't, it's fine. The world is what it is. Things happened. That is the point of history. It is something that constantly happens. This, this belief that we are somehow here to set things right, not going to happen. You know, people have, better people have tried and failed in the past. It is important, of course, to say things. It is important to understand that there was injustice in the past, that things that happened in the past were wrong. But the point is not to make those mistakes again. Not to say that because you did that in the past, now you must pay me. I don't think that's going to, that's not, I don't think that's very wise. I think societies need to develop a sense of inner confidence. And that comes from dealing with your own inner ghosts rather than constantly trying to find somebody else to, to blame and continue to feel like a victim. Also, I think the entire focus on being proud Indians is a bit uh, is a bit too much done. I think we first need to be responsible Indians. So, ma'am, it's uh, the and question is Indian. for you. Uh, will you use his book, uh, his uh, examples, to explain and convince the people uh, about the book you uh, you presented yesterday about the Hindu Muslim feelings and all that? Sorry, when I didn't he, get your question. Will you use his book? or uh, history, what he is uh, telling now, will he use his, uh, his book or presentation as example for the convincing the other communities regarding... I still uh, don't follow your question, sir. Yesterday you did a panel, I believe, where you talked about you know, current-day Hindu-Muslim issues, and he's suggesting you use examples from the book to explain Yes, yes, as I said, it has, it, 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 this, this book really helps us getting equipped with, uh, with a lot of... Uh, uh, the angst that is thrown at us and all the, the, a lot of question mark that is put at us. I think uh, we have a lot to uh, learn from history and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, as I said, not just look at history from the glasses that are 
that are kind of put down on us that look at this is what history was. I think we each need to have our own, uh, we need to engage with it at our own level. And I think writings like this really help do that. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Um, so you said that one thing that the North can learn from the South is how to treat its women. But look at Kerala right now, especially in light of the Shabrimala issue, where women are literally coming out in the streets saying we are impure. And those who literally want to visit the deity are receiving death threats and all. So what went wrong between then and now in As Kerala? I said, you know, with modern education, Kerala absorbed plenty of patriarchy, especially patriarchy of a Victorian vintage. And that is Kerala's tragedy, which is that while we educated our women, we also we sent them to school, but we also told them cover up like this, don't go out with men. You know, you go to a place like Trivandrum, after 7 o'clock the city is dead, you don't see women on the streets. And this is the most literate, educated state, where women have access to hospitals, but they can't walk on the streets after a certain time. I mean, obviously women can. I'm saying that in general, women tend to sort of, you know, stay in after dark and so on. It's not a perfect universe. In many ways, Kerala is way adv in, in advance of other parts of the country. Uh, in many ways, as I said, the, the divorce rate is highest, rape cases are highest in Kerala. It's sometimes used as a statistic to sort of hit Kerala, it's saying oh, rape is highest in Kerala. No, rape is reported in Kerala. In parts of the country, rape is never reported because the stigma attached to strong. Women, do, they suffer and they don't mention it. Whereas in Kerala, the woman has a degree of confidence that if she reports it, justice will be found. Shabrimala is a very complex issue. Naturally, it's become some sort of place where parties have decided that they can show off their political colors and so on. Uh, my, I have an argument for the Shabriya Mala reasons, for, simply for one reason, which is that, uh, the, 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 the debate there, which is that the idea is we must preserve custom. And my point is custom has never been timeless. It has never, ever, ever been timeless. Custom and tradition is eternally changing. It is eternally responding to things that are happening in society around it. So the, the excuses given in Shabriya Mala are, if women, oh, we don't have anything against women, but if fertile women come, it will affect the sanctity of the idol and the deity's founding myth as per the Agamas and the Tantra Samuchayam and all that. The irony is the exact same arguments were used in the 1930s to keep Dalits out of temples. Saying if Dalits come, we have nothing against Dalits, but if they come to temples, then the sanctity of the idol is destroyed. At that time, the Maharaja of Travancore took an executive decision, despite his own committee telling him not to let Dalits in, he took an executive decision and enforced the decision. Think Dalits will go to temples. 20 years later, people realized what was the fuss all about? What happened? Because did, do you think, I, I don't think Shabrimala Ayappan is going to get up and leave if women enter the temple. I don't think his sanctity is going to be destroyed. On the contrary, I think more and more people will end up coming there. You know, so I don't think that gods need protecting from us. We just need protecting from some of the men around us. Good evening. Hi, Manu. Uh, my question, there's a lot to ask, but what I'm really going to ask is, there's a very interesting thing in both your books. The first where you talk about the matrilineal society in Kerala, and the second one where you talk about sultans and the Deccan, which is not as widely read as the northern sultans were, or the Mughals were. Now, very interestingly, we have so many books on the Kohinoor and the Mughals and, you know, the north and the northwestern frontier. Uh, a very interesting thing that I noticed in your books is you write about the people who are not spoken about and people who've not, who've been ignored by those who've been in power to suppress them. So when we talk about a matrilineal society, the reason I believe that the narrative hasn't reached such a large uh, part of us is because we have been for such a long time under a patriarchal narrative which would take every opportunity to suppress anything that goes against what they are. So women were always, you know, you know, anything which shows women as powerful, strong, uh, logical, intellectual creatures would always be suppressed. And when you write a book like The Ivory Throne, it you know, not only brings that, that out in the open, but also uh, kills the notion which we are used to or conditioned to. And same for the Sultans the Deccan, that there's so much matter in the Deccan, yet we only study about, uh, I studied in the north, and you only study about Shivaji, and you, you, know, you have to come to Bombay and read about the Peshwas and the Nizams and everything else that happens here. Was that a conscious decision? 
I think I am, I am interested in people who've been footnoted in history. You know, people who are, who become who have cameos in some sort of larger narrative and then are conveniently forgotten. And that seems to somehow motivate me. I do want to sort of resurrect their stories and tell them, because these stories are fascinating. You know, they are stories that we can really learn from. They do challenge very many notions that we hold dear and eternal and timeless and all of that. And these stories therefore need to be told. Now, Shivaji deserves his place in history. He was a towering figure, very charismatic, did something new. But my whole point is that he was not the only figure. If he arrived on the stage at that particular time, the stage was set by other people. Who were those people? You know, that is what is interesting. The patriarchy is sometimes fascinating because in general, history is his story. The material is written by men. The chronicles are written by men. Very rarely do you have a woman appear. And when a woman appears, it's normally she's sticking to standards set by men. So again, there's a little bit of a problem there. And when women try to flout it, they get ostracized and thrown out. Uh, so in that sense, an inherent patriarchy, so you have to consciously open your eyes and think, hold on, I may have my primary sources, but remember that this is still at some level patriarchal. In the Deccan, one of the most curious stories I found was there's a celebrated warrior princess called Chan Bibi who stood up to the Mughals and eventually was assassinated. But because she was assassinated, she was, she was martyred in, the, uh, in her defense against the Mughals and so on. Ironically, she was killed by the men around her, not by the enemy, but let's forget that because, and paint her as some sort of martyr and goddess. But because she died tragically, she's been enshrined as some sort of ideal. But the more interesting story is her mother, Khunza Humayun. Because Khunza Humayun did not die at the end of a sword. For her, there was no martyrdom, there was no dying romantically where you can just put her either as a goddess or, or as a villain. This woman, her, she was regent for her son for about six years and she enjoyed power. The men around her didn't like it. And towards the end, she, it, was, it almost looked like she didn't want to give up power. So they eventually orchestrated a coup, got her out, and she languished, languished in prison for about 15 years. Which meant when you rot away, no, no poet is going to tell your stories. Nobody, you're not romantic enough to be remembered. So when a woman wanted power like a man would, she wanted to hold on to power on an everyday basis rather than leading an army or whatever, then she's not good. If she's leading an army and being a heroine like some sort of goddess, then it's fine. But if you're an everyday person who seeks power, who wants to influence power, that is not cool. And with Kunza, the funniest thing is not only was she expunged from the records, her own son took miniature paintings that she and her husband had commissioned, where she's seen seated in her husband's lap in some work, in some works, she's seated, uh, sitting next to him in some works. She's painted over. She's been reduced to a massive blot in all of these paintings because she's actually wiped out, not only expunged from the record, but wiped out even from the visual material we have from that time. So history has not been kind to women in general. So I'm interested, therefore, in the stories. In my first book, I was fascinated because the protagonist and the villain of the piece, they're both women. So it is fascinating to see this epic battle between these two women for power and greed and all of that in the, in the, in the early 20th century. But they're both strong, powerful, interesting women. So that opened up my mind in many ways. And, and I figured out that you know, women are also very interesting beings in their own way. They can, you can have a ruthless, villainous person, but you can also find someone who's trying to subscribe to Victorian notions and all of that. And that dynamic was fascinating. So I tried to resurrect as many women as possible. Deccan, again, sadly, there aren't enough uh, women who, who survive on the record. So as you go further back in history, they're either uh, wives of kings or daughters of kings or the Jahanaras. But I encourage you to read Ira Mukoti's book, uh, Daughters of the Sun, uh -huh. which is about Mughal Begums. And you also learn very... heroines, I think, has yeah. the Hazrat Mahal yeah. in it. N not just her, you know. Look at the earlier Mughal women. They, they didn't live in... I mean, they were, they were harem women, yeah. but they were also political actors. They went out and negotiated trade treaties. Sometimes they were handed over as trophies of war and they came back. They fought their bad battles in life and came back. Humayun, you know, we think of him as a Mughal emperor, but he also a six, lost a six-year-old girl in battle. She drowned to death and her body was never found. And his pain as a father comes across in that. So even in a battlefield, there was a six-year-old girl. The women are there. Their stories are just not told well enough and not told properly. Okay, one last question. That hand that's there at the back. Can you please pass the mic? Uh, he stood up, the man who's standing up. I know your face. <laughs> okay, that's the last question and you, you can of course talk to Manu outside. Hey Manu. So uh, I just, my question is about history and learning it in the age of the internet. That does, we have this huge inflection point in how much information is being shared and how quickly it's being shared. So do you think the entire, uh, the whole, uh, the way we learn history, how we learn history, all of it is changing because of the internet? 
I think what about WhatsApp history? Oh God, yeah. WhatsApp history and Twitter history, I encourage everybody to avoid because what you see in a screen, screenshot can only be so limited. So there's, there's, I mean, it can only be so true. It can only go so far. A screenshot is a screenshot. And, and what about those bullet points that we get, those long those, forwarded uh, threads, messages? Uh, don't even ask. Like, it's some, at some levels, it's frustrating to see that it's so easy now to sort of disseminate bad history or history that's limited or deliberately limited because it wants to peddle something. But all the same, I don't, I, I don't think I'm going to buy into long-term pessimism because, you know, you can sustain a lie so far. These platforms are new. This medium is new. People are, people are still getting used to the speed of the internet. People are still getting used to Twitter and Instagram and all these platforms. At some point, the value, the truth has will come back. There's only so far you can peddle a lie. At some point, you know, I'm happy for people to do their WhatsApp history and Twitter history, do all that you want. But I'm happy doing my book because I know that 10 years from now, when someone wants to be serious about it, they will come and pick up a book. They will stop relying on Twitter history and WhatsApp history. So in some ways, it's scary because right now it's being used for politics. That is scary. The speed, the, the pace, the reach of the internet. A book does not, you have to make the effort of reading a book. Whereas with Twitter, it comes to you. It comes to your phone. It comes on your WhatsApp feed. That is scary. But on the whole, I think technology will eventually end up serving history well because, you know, Archives and archival material, which was which you would have to go to London to find, now they're all being digitized. Which means you pay a fee. Sitting in Bombay, you can access material in the New York Public Library in the, from the from Robert Clive's papers, you know, in, in, which are sitting in London. Things that you can do sitting here. So you can start going to the source using the internet. But this is a long battle. I think the truth, as it were, or people trying to do history in a constructive way, will win the battle eventually, or will will win the larger war eventually, even though they're losing battles at present, perhaps. Okay, that's all we have for today, folks. Thank you so much for staying Thank with Thank you for us. listening and thank you, Nazia, you for your moderation.